we will start recording. All right. Last time we talked about what is the law. We talked about where it came from and the different institutional sources of law, that is the common law and the doctrine of following precedent and statutory law and administrative law. We talked about the differences between substantive law and the rules of equity. We talked about the difference between substantive law, the subject matter of a lawsuit, and procedural law, the framework under which actions may be brought. We also talked about the fact that there are two different kinds. No problem, Amanda. I assume people may be popping in and out as we go along. Um, I am recording, so if you miss something, you'll be able to check the recording. Um, Laurel, if you have no audio, I think everybody else can hear me. Sometimes you need to log out and log back in and then the audio works. Sometimes you may have to use the dial-up to call in for the audio piece of it. Um, I, don't, I don't know enough about how to troubleshoot Blackboard to give you more information. And if she can't hear me, talking to her is not helping. I, I should get better at this. Um, I logging out. And back in or using the dial up for sound. There we go. Paloma, I got you. I saw you were logging in. Okay, so we talked about substance and equity and the substantive law versus the procedural law, which is the framework under which all actions are brought regardless of subject matter. Civil versus criminal are the two different types of matters. Some matters arise under criminal law. That's where someone... Um, where the state brings an action against an individual to determine if they have broken society's laws and to punish accordingly. Civil cases, one person is complaining about the actions or inactions of another person that has caused them harm. And that also provides a difference. Um, if anyone does not have their microphone muted, whether they are on dial-up or on the regular, if you can, go ahead and mute your line so that we don't get an echo. That's an important piece of the process here. I appreciate it. Um, so civil actions is where one person files a lawsuit against another for harm that they claim the other person has caused to them and where they are seeking compensation. Finally, we began talking about the role of the courts, whose primary function is to resolve disputes in an orderly manner. We discussed the judiciary as, and the separation of powers and the fact that the judiciary is one of the three co-equal branches of government that serve as a check and balance against each other. We also discussed the doctrine of federalism and the fact that the areas of law have been divided between um, federal law and state law, that the uh, Constitution allocates certain areas of law specifically to the federal government and reserves all of the rest to the state, and that in that matter, then federal courts and state courts function independently of each other. If you don't like what the state court did, you can't move that matter to federal court to try to achieve a different function. Rather, you have to appeal it within the system that you started in. The only overlap there is if you start in a state court, but, it, but after you have exhausted all your state remedies, you still have 
a genuine question of federal law, you have the ability to attempt to appeal that matter to the U.S. Supreme Court, but it is a discretionary appeal to the court. That's all of the things that we discussed in the last class. Does anyone have any questions about any of that before we move forward to be sure that um, everybody is aware and doesn't have any questions on anything we've covered previously? New things build on old things, so I always like to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Okay. Seeing none, we will talk about the role of the courts. The courts play the important role of standing between the government and the individual and affording protection to individual rights within the process. It's the job of the courts to make sure all persons accused of a crime are treated fairly and receive the rights due them under the law. It's the job of the courts to ensure that the majority of citizens do not infringe on the rights of the minority. The theory is that the independence of the judiciary enables the courts to protect the rights of minorities in situations where the legislature may be unable or unwilling to act. Federal judges are perceived to be particularly independent in that federal judges are appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate and once confirmed they serve for life. There is no elective mechanism. That makes the federal judges independent of the will of the electorate. They don't have to stand for election. They are also not subject to the whims of Congress. While the Constitution allocates that Congress gets to decide how much money judges earn, the Founding Fathers wanted to ensure that Congress did not have any type of hold over judges. So while Congress determines the salary schedule for judges, whatever salary a judge is hired at when they're first appointed and confirmed, whatever that salary is, that is their minimum salary forever. Even if Congress decides to change the rate of pay for judges generally, that change in pay rate is not retroactive, does not apply to someone who already has a salary that is above that amount. Rather, they may not get any raises until their salary schedule matches what other judges receive. Um, but they do continue to receive whatever salary they have been earning. That protects judges from doing something that the legislature doesn't like and having the legislature say, yeah, we know you serve for life, we know you're allegedly independent, but we've changed your pay, we didn't like what you did, so we're now going to say that your rate of pay is a dollar a year. Nobody wants to work for a dollar a year, so it's a way to make people want to quit their job. The uh, Founding Fathers didn't want Congress to have that power, and so in the Constitution it provides that Congress does not have the power to cut judicial salaries. That makes the federal judiciary independent of the electorate because there's no elective mechanism and independent of Congress because once they have been confirmed they serve for life and Congress doesn't even have the ability to control their earning capacity or their income as it were and so the judges 
have the ability to act in a manner that they feel is just and right under the law, even if they're, what they determine to be just and right is unpopular. Um, the th thought is that this makes those judges more independent. The reality is once a president appoints a judge and that judge is confirmed or justice, they serve for life. Just because you were appointed by a particular president doesn't mean you belong to them as actually President Trump learned somewhat to his detriment in decisions that were made by the Supreme Court just this very session. Matters where the president had a particular opinion and the administration argued certain ways, even justices that were appointed by this current president issued opinions that were contrary to the opinion he was putting forth the president who appointed doesn't have any power to unappoint you or to withdraw you from the bench. Once you are confirmed, you're confirmed. So there aren't, despite the representations that have been made by politicians, there aren't, in fact, Clinton judges and Bush judges and Obama judges and Trump judges. There are just federal judges. And each of those federal judges tries to the best of their ability to interpret and to apply the federal law the way they perceive it to work. Even when their perception of what is just and right under the law does not comport with what the person who appointed them thought it was going to be. And we have a long history of this. When President Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren as Chief Justice of the United States, I don't think he had any idea how former law school professor and legal scholar Earl Warren was going to look at individual questions of law put to him as a Chief Justice. And the Warren Court did a lot of things that some people have said were extremely liberal and somewhat radical and they found to be unusual given that this Chief Justice of the United States was in fact appointed by a fairly conservative individual. Presidents select people they think have the types of opinions and type of judicial demeanor that they are seeking that does not necessarily turn out to be true and things change. I think the president thought that Neil Gorsuch was a strict constructionist, but I think he thought strict constructionism in the way in which Antonin Scalia looked at strict constructionism, not as Gorsuch has now explained it his perception, which is that we're going to take the plain meaning of the words. We're not going to worry about what the people who wrote it actually intended. We're going to look at how that plain meaning affects how things should be applied to a modern day situation where life may have changed since when the law was written. And that's how he arrived at the fact that when Title VII was written and they wrote that Title VII prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex. On the basis of sex included not only issues of gender, that is if you were male or female, it also included issues of gender identity and it also included um, issues of sexual orientation, that all of those types of discrimination in employment were part of the words discrimination on the basis of sex. In 1964, I'm not sure the people who wrote that intended it that way. That way. But his 
reading of the plain meaning of the statute and what type of discrimination they intended to prohibit. That is, you shouldn't be able to discriminate against someone because they are male or female, extended also to gender identity, also extended to sexual orientation, and that is now the law of the land. Um, I don't think that's quite what President Trump had in mind when he appointed Justice Gorsuch. That, I may be completely wrong, but I, I don't think that's really what he had in mind. Just my opinion. Judges, especially federal judges, are independent. On the state side, state judges are selected in a variety of manners um, and are deemed to be more or less independent in part by how they are selected. Some states elect judges on what we call a partisan ballot. That is, judges declare that they are a member of a political party and they run on the ballot listed as a member of that party. That's how we elect judges in Texas. So on the ballot in November, next to every candidate's name, it will say whether they are a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or an Independent. On the presidential side, it may also have Green Party and several other parties. That doesn't usually show up all the way down in the judicial races. What is going to be different in the November election is that thanks to a law passed by the Texas legislature in 2017 made effective for the 2020 general election, there is no longer any straight ticket balloting. That is at the top of your ballot, you will not have a choice to just vote for a political party and thus vote for all candidates who are members of that political party. You will be required to vote each individual race for every vote you choose, every race you choose to vote in. You can do a one and done vote for president and say, I don't care about any of the other races, don't vote anything else. Or you can vote every single race, or you can pick and choose which races you vote in, but you can't just pick a party to vote for. There is no longer any straight ticket balloting. Not for Republicans, not for Democrats, it's just not there. The legislature decided, actually the Republicans in the legislature decided that straight ticket balloting was benefiting the Democrats more than the Republicans, so they got rid of it. I think the results from the 2018 election seem to indicate that straight ticket balloting actually favors Republicans over Democrats, but I guess we'll see after the November election. Um, but that's a change. Other states elect judges on a nonpartisan ballot. That is, judicial candidates run against each other, but they don't declare a party, much as we elect members of the city council and the mayors. Those are nonpartisan races. Oftentimes, those individuals have affiliations with parties, but they do not run as a member of the party. In other states, they have a Judicial Appointments Commission that appoints judges to different positions, and then those judges stand for what we call a retention election. In other words, that judge in that seat does not run against someone else, an alternate candidate for that position. They run on their own record, and the voters vote whether or not to retain that judge as a judge. If someone is not retained 
in a retention election, then they no longer sit on that bench and the Judicial Appointments Commission appoints somebody new to that bench. The person who was not retained is not eligible for reappointment to that same position, having not been retained. Each of these mechanisms, while having an elective component, may create greater or lesser independence of the judiciary. And depending upon the judicial temperament of the individual elected or selected, they may or may not be as fair as otherwise. There are judges who make decisions they believe to be fair, just, and right, and don't worry as much about what the electorate is going to do, hoping that they will get reelected, even though what they've done has not been popular. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. It varies greatly. So state judges tend to be seen as less popular, as less independent than federal judges because state judges tend to be less willing to make unpopular decisions for fear of losing their job. The main purpose of the court and judges, the role of the judicial branch, is indirect. It is to reconfirm and strengthen existing law, to widen or narrow the application of existing law, to overturn existing laws that conflict with laws at a higher level of authority. Judges are what we call passive arbiters. That is, judges do not go out looking for business. The President of American proposed legislation. Congress and state legislatures can propose and enact laws. The judiciary is passive. They don't go out telling people to file lawsuits. They don't go looking for situations where they think there's a dispute and tell people, come and file your lawsuit so we can resolve this matter. They have to wait till somebody files a lawsuit. Even then, we have an adversarial system of justice. The judge is a passive arbiter. The judge doesn't call any witnesses. For the most part, the judge doesn't ask witnesses any questions. Each of the parties decide which witnesses to call and what questions to ask, what evidence to present to the court. It is the judge's job to listen to that evidence and then to make a decision based on what has been presented. The only time that a judge, okay, <laughs> thank you, Mary, I wondered what that was. The only time a judge makes a decision during a lawsuit is if someone makes an objection. That is, you call a witness or you ask a question that the other side thinks violates the rules of evidence, once an objection is made, then the judge can make a ruling on it. Once a decision is made by the Supreme Court, it remains the law of the land unless or until something changes to demonstrate that the rule of law has, as decided by the court is invalid or should not be applied. And that generally takes a pretty significant change in circumstances to get the court to overrule itself. It is possible to overturn a Supreme Court decision only by the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court tends to do that very rarely and only when they see a significant change of circumstances. 
with regard to trials. As I say, the court is a passive arbiter. Um, doesn't work that way. It's not individual states. Supreme Court does not decide hypothetical questions or give advisory opinions. They decide individual cases based on facts as presented and they accept cases based on what's been presented and what conflicts may exist in order to have the same law apply throughout the country. Um, if a change in law is desired, the way to do that is either through legislation, that is through Congress, or by getting Congress to propose a constitutional amendment if it's a matter that on constitutional grounds has been decided by the court. As I say, occasionally the court will reread something and change their mind, but it's usually very rare. Um, the situation that I can cite to you that is most commonly considered the exception that proves the rule is that in the late 1800s, the Supreme Court made a decision in a case called Plessy versus Ferguson where they ruled in a case pertaining to Pullman railroad cars, that's railroad sleeper cars, that so long as equal accommodations were available, you could have separate accommodations based upon race. That created the doctrine of separate but equal. Fast forward to the early 1950s, and the court reconsidered the question of segregation where the subject matter was not Pullman railroad cars, the subject was public education. And in that case, the Supreme Court, in a single opinion, unanimously decided, one voice opinion written by the Chief Justice, expressly overturned Plessy versus Ferguson and ruled that the very act of separation in and of itself created inequality. What was different between the 1880s and the 1950s was 70 years of experience of what separation meant. The decision in Brown versus Board of Education that held that segregated schools were inherently unequal and should not be allowed was not popular. It was not what the states wanted, what the states and everybody else who were talking to the court other than the plaintiffs who brought the, case, the lawsuits was just leave the status quo. The Supreme Court said the status quo is not appropriate. We are creating a huge system that creates injustice and we're going to change that. And they did. They changed the rule and said segregation is not legal in this country. Separate but equal is inherently unequal. The court then sent the matter back for further action and for the individual states and school districts to um, enact appropriate legislation to apply what was taking place and what decision had been made. Um, which legislatures did and didn't do some to their own detriment. But while the Supreme Court does change its mind, it is a very, very rare circumstance. To get back to courts and judges as passive arbiters in a trial, which is not an appeal, this is where we're presenting evidence, the judge sits and listens to what is presented. As I said, the only time the judge gets involved is when an objection is made. 
if you don't object, you lose the right to complain after the fact. So you lose your right to complain that they allowed evidence they shouldn't have or didn't allow evidence they should have because you didn't object to it at the time it occurred. And I'll give you an example. The day I was sworn in as a lawyer, um, the law firm I was working for as a clerk and about to work for as an associate attorney had a case pending at the Tarrant County Courthouse. So they contacted the presiding judge of that court and asked her if we came early if she would swear me in as a lawyer because any district court judge can swear in a new lawyer who's received the appropriate paperwork from the state that they've passed the bar exam. And so I went into court having prepared the case for trial for the partner who was supposed to try the case and was sworn in as a lawyer in front of Judge, by Judge Mary Ellen Hicks. Um, after I was sworn in and they took care of some other business, the partner who was supposed to be the first chair on the case took the file that I had prepared for him for trial, handed it to me and said, you prepared it, you try it. I'll just sit here and help. So I, the same day I try, I was sworn as a lawyer, I tried my first case. Um, we were defending a divorce action, and we had filed a counteraction, countersuit for divorce for fault grounds. So the petitioner was the husband, and he had petitioned for divorce. We answered his petition and countersued also for divorce, alleging both no-fault divorce and divorce on the basis of, fraud, of fault, that he had done things that broke up the marriage and that he should be um, punished for that, that our client was entitled to a disproportionate portion of the property because she had done everything to maintain the marriage and the husband had violated that. He had filed the divorce on his own. That is, he was representing himself. He was filing pro se. So the judge calls the case and the petitioner asks the petitioner if he's ready to proceed. He says yes. Asks our side if we're ready pr to proceed. And I say yes, we're ready to proceed. And the judge then proceeds to instruct the petitioner that he is entitled to hire a lawyer should he choose to do so. And he said, I know, Your Honor, I think I'm fine representing myself. And then the judge said very specifically to him, do you understand that I do not represent you, that it is my job to listen to what is presented and to then make appropriate decisions and that I can't advise you of what you should do during the trial. That it will be up to you to know both the rules of procedure and the rules of evidence and to act accordingly under those rules of evidence without any input from me as to what you should or should not do. And the petitioner said, I understand that I will be fine. He was convinced he was the smartest mind in the room. He thought he was smarter than the judge. He was certainly smarter than his soon-to-be ex-wife. And he had been present in the courtroom when I was sworn in as a lawyer. So he knew that 10 minutes before, I hadn't even been a lawyer. So he didn't figure I was going to be any problem at all. He also did not have a very high opinion of women, just in general, which was part of why the partner who was male wanted me to try the case because he thought that that would get under the petitioner's skin and he'd make even more mistakes, and he was right. So judge said, then if you're ready to proceed, call your first witness. And he was the petitioner, so he got to call the first witness. And he called himself, at which point I knew he truly did not know anything about trying a case. Because anybody who knows anything about 
trials knows you always call the other side first to make them commit to what their story is before you tell your story so that you know the slant to put on the testimony you provide and to do things. Well, he would put himself, he didn't say he was at fault. I said he was at fault. He didn't think he'd done anything wrong. He put himself on the witness stand. And the judge didn't make him, act, him ask himself questions. Um, the judge allowed him to testify as a narrative. So he testified why he should be granted a divorce and why he thought he should get the lion's share of the property and a variety of other things. And then when he was done saying what he had to say, he said, okay, Your Honor, I'm finished. And he started to get up. And the judge said, no, you sit down. She gets to ask you questions. And so he sort of sat down in a huff like, oh, why do I have to answer her questions? So I start asking questions. And I started with very innocuous, normal cross-examination questions. And then I started shading toward things that are not allowed under the rules of evidence. I started asking, in particular, questions that assumed facts not in evidence. In other words, I hadn't put on any evidence that he had moved community funds out of bank accounts, but I asked him, where did you move the money? I didn't ask him if he moved the money, just where did the, you move the money? And I asked it that way to see if he would object, if he knew enough about the rules to know that that was not a proper question. He didn't know. He didn't make an objection. He answered the questions. I asked him all kinds of questions. By the time we were done, he had testified as to where he, where and how he had moved the hundreds of thousands of dollars that were missing from the community estate. He had testified to the fact that, yes, he had a girlfriend and whose business was that of anybody else's and why should that impact any decisions about his divorce. He and his wife were separated and should have been separated many years before they separated, and it really didn't matter that she had paid to put him through school to become an engineer. Why should he have to share anything he had earned as a result of that degree that she paid for? So I finally got everything I needed, and I passed the witness. He called my client as a witness. And then he tried to start asking her the same kinds of questions I asked him. And as soon as he asked a question that assumed facts not in evidence, I stood up and I said, objection, your honor, assumes facts not in evidence. And the judge looked at me with sort of a little smile and said, sustained, and told him, you can't ask that question. So then he tried to ask it a different way, but basically the same question. And I objected and she sustained it. After the third or fourth time this happened, he looks at the judges, Your Honor, how come she got to ask those questions? And the judge looked at him and said, You didn't object. Do you remember when I asked you if you understood the rules of evidence and the requirements? And that I did not have the authority to intervene unless you asked for intervention for a specific, for relief from a specific question, and you didn't object. So it all came in. She knows her rules, and she's objecting, and you're not entitled to ask those questions. So belatedly, he figured out I actually knew what I was doing. We got to the end, and my client, um, Exactly. He handed me my case. My client received her divorce for fault, received a disproportionate portion of the community estate and a judgment for the money he had defrauded the estate from. And I had the judge make a ruling 
that his moving of the money in violation of a restraining order, which was in existence, did in fact constitute fraud on the community. He thought he was still home free because he had had a plan. He'd gotten all this money out of his name anyway. His plan was as soon as he was divorced, he was toddling on down the road to the bankruptcy court so that even though he was ordered to pay a lot of the bills, since they were community bills, he was going to get himself discharged from them and leave my client with the bills and anything the court had ordered he had to pay because he defrauded the, the community. He was going to get her, dis, her judgment discharged also. Unfortunately, he hadn't bothered to read the bankruptcy statutes either. When we got to the meeting of creditors, where he did actually hire a lawyer to handle his bankruptcy, um, and they were talking about all the matters that were going to be discharged, I appeared at the meeting of creditors on behalf of my client to confirm the judgment and that the judgment was non-dischargeable and presented to the attorney that we were going to file a motion to have this particular judgment found to be non-dischargeable because it was awarded on the base, basis of fraud. And the lawyer took one look at the judgment, which I presented a copy of, and told his client, why'd you tell me this was no big deal? You just wanted it. It was just a judgment. Fraud is not dischargeable. He couldn't discharge the child support, and he couldn't discharge the judgment for fraud. And I got her to word the judgment such that any failure to pay any debts he was ordered to pay, leaving them for her, also constituted fraud against the community because he had been ordered to pay those debts during the temporary orders and prior to the resolution of the divorce. And so they were part of her, fraudulent, her judgment for fraud. So he ended up not being able to leave her holding the bag on anything. Why? Because he didn't understand that it doesn't matter how smart you are, you actually have to know what you're talking about, and it doesn't matter what you know or don't know if you don't understand that the judge is not your representative. The judge is passive. The judge's sole job is to sit and listen. The judge has two things. They're the determiner of fact and the interpreter of the law. If you have a jury, the jury becomes the trier of fact, the determiner of fact, but the judge is still the interpreter of the law. If the judge is determining the facts, they sift through all the facts and decide what they believe and apply the law. If the jury is deciding which facts are believed, they still have to apply the law as given to them by the judge. And they ultimately then arrive at a decision, a verdict, which the court then reduces to writing in the form of a document we call a judgment. A judgment is a final order of the court resolving all issues in the case and providing a judgment, a decision that can be acted upon for collection, but there is no other actions to be taken. In contrast, an order is a non-final directive of the court to one or more parties to do something. So when you get a judgment, all that's left is to enforce that judgment. You have resolved all the issues in the case. Any questions about any of that? If not, we will proceed. Okay, order versus judgment. So an order is a non-final instruction or directive of the court to take certain action. 
a judgment is a final decision in the matter issued in the form of a written document that resolves all the issues in the case and makes a final determination of, of the outcome of the case and what should happen. Okay. Let me type that. Okay. Uh, easier to give an example. So a judgment is that final order. An order is, in general, a response to a motion. So if a party moves that um, the other side should be compelled to provide certain information as a part of discovery, that's an order. If the judge orders that, issues a directive that no party can talk to the media during the pendency of the lawsuit, that's an order. That's what a gag order would be. That would be an order saying that in order to prevent there from being adverse pretrial publicity that may harm the ability to achieve justice, no parties are supposed to discuss the matter with the press. That is a non-final directive of the court that exists only while the lawsuit is pending. We sometimes have, as Jeanette mentioned, an, a dismissal order, an order to dismiss. It, in general, an order dismissing the case is on the basis that someone didn't do something they were supposed to do. That is a directive of the court dismissing the matter but it generally doesn't dismiss it forever in that that would be an instruction to dismiss the current action without prejudice. That is, without preventing the party who originally brought the action from refiling it in proper form. Does that help? Okay. If there are no other questions on Chapter 1, we will proceed to discuss Chapter 2, which brings us to the criminal justice system. A crime is an action that offends the morality of society and that society has determined it will not tolerate. Crimes are specifically defined by statute and they are composed of individual elements, each of which must be proven in order to find someone guilty of a crime. I'm going to give that definition again. A crime is an action that offends the morality of society and that society has determined it will not tolerate. It is specifically defined by statute. That is, there are no common law crimes. And each crime is composed of individual elements, all of which must be proven in order to prove someone is guilty of that crime. The criminal justice system is the system we have created to handle individuals who are alleged to have committed a crime. The criminal justice system in this country was created by in, in a format based almost exclusively on the concerns of our founding fathers that it was important to restrict the power of government and to protect the rights of individual citizens. And they did this by enacting the Bill of Rights, 
which is the foundation of our criminal justice system, the Bill of Rights being the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. It's the job of any criminal justice system to try to strike a balance between protecting the rights of the accused, punishing wrongdoers, and enforcing the law to protect society and deter future crimes. Federal courts hear violations of federal criminal law. State courts hear violations of state criminal law. No crossover. You commit a state crime, you go to state court. You commit a federal crime, you go to federal court, period. There are basically two types of violations. We have felonies and we have misdemeanors. Misdemeanors are your more minor criminal charges. In Texas, we have three levels of misdemeanors. We have Class A, Class B, and Class C misdemeanors. Class C misdemeanors are your lowest level of criminal charges. These are crimes for which the maximum punishment is a fine. Class C misdemeanors have no jail time. Class A and Class B misdemeanors are also minor charges or less serious charges, but they carry with them the potential for fines or jail time or both. Class B misdemeanors are less serious than Class A misdemeanors. So the lowest level is C, the intermediate level of a misdemeanor is a B, the highest level misdemeanor, the most serious misdemeanor is a Class A misdemeanor. It carries the potential for a fairly hefty fine and up to two years in jail. And jail sentences for misdemeanors are served in the county jail, not in the prison system. Felonies are your more serious crimes. Um, homicide, arson, rape, etc. In Texas, the hierarchy of felonies is that we have four classifications of felonies. At the lowest level, you have what are called state jail felonies. These are one step up from a Class A misdemeanor and below a third degree felony. These are felonies where the sentence is served in the county jail rather than going to prison, should you be given jail time. There is the potential for jail time or a fine or both. Third degree felonies are less serious than second degree felonies are less serious than first degree felonies. A first degree felony is your most serious crime. First-degree murder is the most serious first-degree felony, and then it can be enhanced by special circumstances to become capital murder. So capital murder is not its own classification of felony. It is a first-degree felony with special circumstances, additional evidence that you have to prove in order to justify the death penalty being applicable to the crime charged. Um, we have a hierarchy of courts. We've talked about that there are trial courts and intermediate appellate courts and highest courts. On the federal side, your trial courts are your U.S. district courts. Your intermediate appellate courts are the U.S. courts of appeals in 13 circuits. And at the highest level, you have the U.S. Supreme Court. States that do not have the death penalty do not have <clears throat> capital crime attachment because capital means crime for which capital punishment is available, that is the death penalty. 
It's just another word for the death penalty. Um, on the state side, we have trial courts, intermediate appellate courts, and then a highest court. And the highest court in Texas for criminal matters is the Court of Criminal Appeals. For trial courts, we have different levels I don't understand the question, Rahim. We don't have things called infractions. We just have crimes. Um, on the trial court side, um, different court, we have three levels of trial courts that hear different matters. Class C misdemeanors are tried in justice of the peace courts or in municipal courts. Class A and Class B misdemeanors are tried in county court, either constitutional or statutory county court. And felonies are all tried in district court. Matters from any of those may be appealed, and once appealed, will go ultimately to the Intermediate Court of Appeals, or the Texas Courts of Appeals, of which there are 14, for a determination if they accept the appeal. If you don't like the results there and you have grounds for appeal, you can appeal that further to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Note that the Texas Supreme Court does not appear in that hierarchy anywhere. The Texas Supreme Court is supreme only in civil cases. The Court of Criminal Appeals and the Supreme Court do not share cases. They don't transfer cases between themselves. They do not have jurisdiction over matters handled by the other. They don't talk to each other. If you are appealing a criminal matter, the highest court in Texas for that matter <clears throat> is the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. If you have exhausted all of your state remedies and you still have a federal constitutional question, you can appeal that matter to the U.S. Supreme Court and they have the discretion to accept that appeal and to make a determination. But it has to be a, a genuine question of federal law. It can be a constitutional question under the U.S. Constitution, or it can be a question based on other U.S. federal law or a federal treaty, for example. So the federal question must arise from the U.S. Constitution or the statutes and laws written by Congress or any treaties to whom to which the US government is a party. If you don't have that genuine federal question, your last stop is the Court of Criminal Appeals. I'm sorry it went out, Sarah, thank you for coming back. Um Whether a matter is a state crime or a federal crime, all crimes are, are covered by individual statutes and they are composed of individual elements, um, each of which must be proven. Yes, the Supreme Court accepts a very small portion of the cases appealed to it if they don't accept your case whatever the decision of the final court you were in, that is the final decision in your case. The Supreme Court often takes cases specifically because one case is resolved one way and in another jurisdiction a case has been resolved in a different way and so they take the case to resolve the conflict between the different courts. 
with regard to a state case that they're taking on appeal. Most commonly that happens where there is a confusion as to how the law applies because there have been different rulings in different states or because there is a significant question of federal law and its applicability that has been raised. Um, in this most recent term, the Supreme Court accepted jurisdiction and heard a case out of Oklahoma that was a state criminal case where the issue was whether um, under the Federal Major Crimes Act, a crime committed in the city of Tulsa by a member of a Native American tribe could be tried in Oklahoma State Court or did the fact that there was a treaty that provided that the Creek Nation included the property that included where this took place, which is 90% of the city of Tulsa and a vast majority of the surrounding area as Native American reservation, if that treaty required that any trial of a crime take place in a federal court under this Major Crimes Act that pertain to crimes committed on Native American lands by Native Americans. And the Supreme Court ruled that the treaty was valid and still in existence and had not been revoked and that yes, this matter had to be tried in a federal court pursuant to the federal statutes pertaining to Indian Territory, Native American Territory, and not in state court because the land had been sold to individuals and was not considered, at least by the state, to still be part of the Native American reservation. So the court accepted the case because it involved a federal treaty, and in this case, they actually upheld the treaty. Criminal statutes, um, each state determines, determines what will be a crime in that state and what the classification of that crime is. There is a lot of commonality state to state about what the level of a crime is. First degree murder, intentional premeditated murder is generally considered to be a first degree felony or whatever the classification they use for the highest level of felony in a given state. But there's no law that requires that. Each state has determined that the seriousness of that crime justifies it having that highest classification. And different states call their classifications different things. Texas, we use first, second, and third degree and state jail felonies. Those classifications may be different in other states. In the book, it discusses two, the legislative branch, yes. All crimes are specifically defined by statute, and statutes are created by the legislature. So in this case, because we're talking about a state crime, the state legislature will decide what is a crime and whether that crime is a misdemeanor or a felony, and then within that classification, what the level is for that particular crime. The book discusses two individual crimes and gives you their elements. These are not necessarily the elements of these crimes in Texas. This is a generic explanation so you can see how elements of the crime work. And I want to go through these with you and give you some examples to give you a better picture of how it works. And so the book indicates the crime of burglary is usually composed of five elements, the breaking and entering of a dwelling of another with the intent to commit a felony in the structure. You have to prove all five of those things. A passerby sees 
a house with a door standing open and they go in the house and they steal a bunch of things that were in the house. Is this burglary? No, you are correct. There was no breaking because the door was open. So no breaking, but there was entering of a dwelling, it's a house, of another, the person who broke in didn't live there, with an intent to commit a felony. They intended to steal something at a, of enough value to constitute a felony. So while it is a crime, it could be robbery, it could be theft, it could be a lot of other crimes, it's not this crime. Another situation. You have a husband and wife who separate. The wife gets possession of the marital residence, changes the locks on the door. Husband comes to the house, finds that his key doesn't work, breaks down the door, comes into the house, and commits family violence. That is, commits assault and battery against the wife. Burglary? No. It's not this crime because while it is breaking and entering and it's a dwelling and there was an intent to commit a felony on the premises to it beating the person up, it was not of another. Husband was still on the mortgage, still on the lease. It was still, he, was, he still had a part ownership interest or occupational interest in it, even if there was a court order preventing him from being there. It would be a crime, but it would not be this crime. Third example. You're driving down the street and suddenly you hear the tornado sirens go off and you look up and there in front of you, not a block away, is a funnel cloud that looks like it's about to touch down. And you park your car and you run to the nearest place, nearest home, because you're on a residential street, and you pound on the door and you pound on the door and you ring the doorbell and nobody answers and you finally break in. And you go find a place, an internal place, where you think you'll be safe from the tornado. This crime? No. It is breaking and entering of a dwelling of another. But your sole intent was to trespass. Trespassing is a misdemeanor. So there was no intent to commit any type of felony. You were not there to harm the property. You were not there to harm anyone else or to steal anything. Your intent was to locate safety. Oh, it is still a crime. I didn't say it wasn't a crime. I just said it's not this crime. You've still committed trespass. If you're in Texas, you may get shot. On the flip side, the fact that nobody answered the door means it's somewhat unlikely that someone is there to shoot you. But you never know. Um, bottom line, yes, it's a crime, but it's not this crime. You have, in order to prove this crime, you have to prove each and every individual element. The book discusses that first degree murder is the act of intentionally or knowingly causing the death of an individual. We sometimes in the vernacular call first degree murder premeditated murder because you intentionally or knowingly cause the harm, which means when you engage in the conduct, you know or you have the intent to cause this harm. Most crimes require 
both a criminal act, what we call actus reus, and intent, or a criminal mind, as it were, the mens rea. Um, as with any crime charged, the circumstances under which the crime was committed may implicate or impact what's going on. That's where both the mens rea and the actus reus come in to play. In other words, they're going to look at intent. If it was not your intent to cause harm, it was not your intent to damage property, it was not your intent to commit a felony, um, you can't prove this crime. So when you are bringing a criminal charge, you have to look at both the actus reus, what actually happened, what are the actions that constitute the crime, and what was the intent of the person, what was in their mind, what is what we call the mens rea, the criminal mind, the intent to cause the harm. Um, in other words, generally to commit a crime, you not only have to commit the act or fail to commit an act for wrongful purpose. Wrongful purpose can include recklessness sufficient to cause harm. So that criminal mind can be inferred, that mens rea can be inferred from actions that show a reckless or conscious disregard for the safety of others, which oftentimes arises when someone is in some form or fashion impaired, as with someone who's driving a motor vehicle under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Their criminal mind is going to be inferred from the fact that they knew or should have known they were impaired and they recklessly chose to engage in conduct that could cause harm in a situation where they disregarded the potential for harm to other people. The vast majority of crimes are state crimes. There has been an increase recently in the number of activities that are considered to be federal crimes. Many of the, much of the increase in criminal litigation on the federal side has to do with drug crimes. And so there has been a greater federal criminalization of drug-related acts. Um, other than that, most federal crimes have to do with intentional violations of federal regulations, violations of um, the Securities Act, or engaging in acts of terrorism against individuals in this country. Um, all of those things would be federal crimes as opposed to state crimes. Okay, next time we're going to discuss <clears throat> the Bill of Rights and specifically the four amendments to the Constitution, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth that collectively make up what we call procedural due process. That is the four amendments <clears throat> to the Constitution that provide the rights of individuals accused of a crime that are required to be protected. Go ahead and read the remainder of Chapter 2. We're not going to get through all of it, not anywhere close next time. Please do not read past the end of Chapter 2 as our first test will cover just uh, Chapters 1 and 2. And I bid you all good evening. If you're in legal research class, I will see you in a few minutes. Have a great evening.
Thank you, Lindsay.